Today's reading comes from Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 13. The scripture passage that we're about to read comes right after the death of John the Baptist, ordered by Herod. Jesus, upon hearing the news, removes himself from the crowds. Hear now the word of God. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and fish and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full and those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. Be Let us pray. God, be in our listening. God, be in our understanding. Amen. Fred Rogers as many of you know, was a Presbyterian pastor who fed large crowds of little ones every day on television. The gentle host and producer of nearly 900 episodes aimed at positively shaping children's lives by giving them some self-confidence and teaching them about kindness. I found this little story that Mr. Rogers, Rogers wrote about renewal. I quote, it's important to know when we need to stop, reflect, and receive. In our competitive world, that might be called a waster of time. I've learned that those times can be the preamble to periods of enormous growth. Recently, I declared a day to be alone with myself. I took a long drive and played a tape. When I got to the mountains, I read and prayed and listened and slept. In fact, I can't remember having a calmer sleep in a long, long time. The next day I went back to work and did more than I usually get done in three days. I wrote in a song that in the long, long trip of growing, there are stops along the way. I wish Mr. Rogers was still here and in charge of television for our young ones. Many of us, I suppose, have experienced caring for young children, and it was a long time ago for me. When my two girls were very little, I remember it being like a full-time job except unpaid, and with no weekends and no evening, uh, evenings off. It was around-the-clock care. And after the toddler phase, I was just so grateful for the season when I began to finally look up at the sky for more than 10 seconds and being so in awe at the world above the ground because my field of vision for a while had been mostly limited to what was happening below the height of my kitchen counter because with toddlers and crawling babies, accidents are continually around the corner and one must constantly have eyes glued on the little humans who are discovering the world with no fear and no understanding of danger and who believe that orange markers and Vaseline belongs on the wall within 30 seconds of being unsupervised. Not easy to function on little sleep, too much caffeine. It's quite a season of life. Parenting little ones is wonderful and tiring. After that danger phase, then we moved to the constant bickering. After, our girls were fighting over things that were so incredibly exasperating because it really didn't matter that the one of them was given purple toy versus the pink toy, but there were hourly dramas between them and life was never fair to either of them. 
That's when I mastered the eye roll, the deep sigh, and the frowny face. Some days felt like perpetual episodes of law and order. I would daydream of peaceful time alone. And occasionally, I would go out on my own, and I'd love the first two hours of freedom. And then I would get antsy. I'd realize I was missing them. My heart would start to ache. I'd call home six times and say, is everything okay? And I'd finally run home and cover them in kisses. Those were the precious moments. Parenting is a great journey that requires a few stops along the way. Being the president of two small human beings is hard enough, but imagine leading a country in the midst of a world war. Winston Churchill had his ups and downs over his long political career, and when his great anxiety was uncontrollable, he turned to painting to clear his mind and to give himself a moment of calm and peace. A stop along the way between ordering deadly attacks and comforting his countrymen, resolving conflicts, a stop to take paint brushes and to paint lovely scenes with a blue sky and a world at peace, something Churchill did throughout his turbulent career. The front of the bulletin is an example of his work. Two years ago, inspired by the work of my dear friend, Pastor Alan Rada, I began a class that would become my all-time favorite called clinical pastoral education. I did my practical hours at a local hospital and after my six-month class ended, I stayed there as a volunteer, just giving about two short hours a week to visit strangers in need. Over time, the behavioral health department of the hospital has occupied most of my visitation time. There I sit with people who have deep depression and anxiety, who are trying to get out of addiction, who don't think they are worthy. Sometimes they have experienced too many big losses and they just can't cope. These visits quickly shape my theological beliefs as I am often asked the big questions, the whys and the where is God in all this? question that would be impossible to address without a strong faith. When I go visit, I regularly run into this one nurse who seems to have several years of experience under her belt. She's been there a while. I can imagine, and she's as much, and as much as I spend time praying with the patients I meet, for some reason she's often on my mind also and I spent time reflecting about her and her demanding work. I wonder if she's experiencing compassion fatigue. I wonder if she gets enough stops along the way. Maybe it's because my mom was also an evening shift nurse in the emergency mental health portion of a busy hospital, and I've heard a lot of stories from her. But for some reason, I just think about this woman a lot. The nurse's station sits under fluorescent lights with no access to daylight, except in the patient's room. The environment is sterile. The wall color is calming, but it just doesn't feel like a bright and sunny place that makes one want to run to work every day. I think about her and how it is for her watching new people come in almost daily with anxiety and depression, addiction, sadness, all desperately hoping to find a beam of light in their dark world, hoping for rest from life's challenges, and which are sometimes situational and sometimes caused by poor brain chemistry. These people come in for renewal, for a little stop along the way of a long life. I know this nurse has seen it all, episodes of paranoia, attempts at suicide. She has gotten used to hearing crying coming of the rooms almost daily. She spends part of her time handing out medication and making sure everyone on the floor is safe and fed. She also sees them improving and going home with new tools. 
When I arrive there, she is often busy filling out reports on the computer. This is a wonderful place for people to find hope, healing, and relief, but the despair is also very palpable. She perhaps has become numb to the crying and to the panic attacks. And then I wonder how excited she was when she graduated from nursing school. Did she celebrate with her friends and her family when she got this position? Was she beaming with pride at the thought of making a difference in the mental health world? And then I wonder where she is today. She might be perfectly happy, but my sixth sense tells me that she's tired. So I pray for her. I pray that she gets to have many stops in her journey of caring for others, of feeding thousands with her compassion. In the long trip of growing, there are stops along the way. Jesus' miracle in this story is the only one that's been told in all four Gospels and a story that we all know very well. Anytime information is repeated in the Bible, it gives us the clue that it carries a very significant message. The version as written in Matthew gives fewer details than in some other accounts, but it appears that Jesus has been teaching and healing relentlessly up to that point, always caring for others. I imagine that his battery might have been a bit low. He had been giving, giving, and giving. The news of John the Baptist came to him in the previous verses, and the author of Matthew is sure to include Jesus' need to get away upon hearing this news. Up to now in that book of Matthew, Jesus had not gone away by himself often except from his time in the wilderness. So we can only imagine his profound grief and possibly even the reminder that suffering was waiting for him as well. So Jesus withdrew to a deserted place. And when he came back, he found himself along, among large crowds who had also followed him to a deserted place between towns. The deserted place was filled with people who were hungry for his teaching, hungry for his healing powers, hungry for his presence. The deserted place is mentioned twice in this short passage. And again, repetition matters. It was the disciples that got the bread and the fish, and it was them who distributed it. They were important participants in the miracle. Jesus' community mattered. He did not do it alone. From his refueled soul, he fueled large crowds through the hands of his disciples. Some of you know too well the demands of caring for your loved one. Accompanying a spouse or parent through a long disease requires resilience, patience, and infinite love. Such was the case with a woman I will call Susan, who had been watching her husband of 62 years battling terminal cancer for the last six months. She knew that his days were counted. She just did not know how many were left. It could take a long time or go downhill quickly. Susan and Bob had always been very close and had raised three beautiful children who were scattered across the country living busy lives. Susan was determined to make each day count. She cooked a lot, always trying to offer Bob his favorite meals, even when he could barely eat. She stopped seeing her friends, dropped out of her volunteer activities, and focused her life on Bob and his appointments. The cancer affected Bob in an unexpected way. The gentle, kind, and soft-spoken man was increasingly angry and unhappy. He did not receive very well his wife's loving care. Susan knew that he was uncomfortable and anxious, but it was hard on her. She had a hard time seeing her loving husband of so long slowly become like a stranger. She kept doing what she had to do, but darkness began to surround her. She felt lonely and defeated. 
She had imagined his journey a million times, picturing herself loving him gently through the end. And yet someday she had a hard time feeling affection for the gruff man that she barely recognized. She felt like she had been hired as home care help. Imagine her surprise one day when three of her closest friends rang the doorbell and told her that they were taking her away for the day. I can't leave Bob alone, she said, thanking them for the kind thought. No worries, they said. Mary's here too. Out came Mary, the fourth friend, a retired nurse, ready to take care of Bob and his needs. And on that day, Susan smiled and laughed as she walked around town and ate with her friends. And Bob talked nonstop to Mary about his incredible hero and wife, Susan. In the long road of growing up, there are much needed stops along the way. Our Lord Jesus cared so much for the people around him. His mirac miraculous acts came from a place of compassion. He healed the crowds first, then he fed them. We read in Matthew 9, 36, that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He taught his disciples to trust that God would always provide these stops in the deserted places allow for renewal, for refilling of the cup, for reflection, for perspective. When compassion runs low, there is a deserted place somewhere for each one of us to withdraw to. Our greatest teacher of all time has taught us to do so. Our friend and pastor Lori has gone to her deserted place and thanks to our generous session because they believe in the importance of renewal. And upon her return, she will be offering us a great big feast just as Jesus taught her to do. Jesus saves us from hunger and we know he will always provide. By feeding the 5,000 through the hands of the disciples, he has taught us to participate in the big and small miracles of life, those that take compassion, those that feed others. And so the doctors heal, the teachers teach, the caregivers enhance lives, the landscapers beautify creation, the cooks feed, the tutors reinforce, the food pantry helpers distribute, the police officers protect, the writers enrich minds, and the grandparents love and give breaks. We're all disciples in the hands of the great provider and healer, as well as a part of the crowd in this long journey of growing, as we receive our own daily dose of big and small miracles. The great shepherd leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. <laughs>